So now let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. This is it. We've made it, Matt, our deep dive into the sound of music. It's our first ever epic episode. Yes, absolutely epic. Very, 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 very excited about this. We've done old films, but we've never gone this far, really. And I don't think we've ever looked at anything in this much depth before. No, absolutely not. And it's no surprise, I think, that this is Mm -hmm. one of our favourite films ever. Yeah, it is. And that had its 55th anniversary this week. It did, yeah. Since its premiere. So, yeah, the fact that it's still going strong and we still love it as much as we do, that testament it's insane i mean it's Mm. on adverts like i loved that one it was a mother and daughter watching it on the telly and then it kind of like went through the life so she got older and she was watching it and then and she was with a boyfriend with a mother at the Mm. back watching it and then she got older and she had her own kids and they were watching it that encapsulates really what it's all about exactly and why it's endured for so long so that's actually really clever really feel good which is exactly what the film does and speaking of loving the film, mm-hmm. um, I don't know if you're as eager as I am, but the first thing we're going to do today is test our knowledge of the sound <laughs> of music and see who's the bigger fan. Not that it's a competition, Mary. No, I don't think it's a possibility that I could be more excited than you. I love quizzes. I love nuns and nannies. So <laughs> it's couldn't get any better. Let's start the quiz. Okay. Mary, first question to you. Yeah. Upon arrival at the house of Captain Von Trapp, Maria is told that there has been a long line of governesses for his seven children, but what number governess is she? Oh, God. I'm going to go with fifth. Or sixth. Is it sixth? I can't remember. Sixth. No, I'm afraid she's the twelfth. Really? Oh, God. She's the twelfth in a long line. I knew. I know the rest of the line. (laughs) I know the rest of the line. I just don't know the number. That's terrible. Uh Okay, right. Well, mine's actually, my first question for you is about a number. What was the Baroness Schrader's number in the ball game she played with the Von Trapp children? Six. Damn it, yes, that's right. Yeah, 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 thanks. One one point to me. You have a much better (laughs) memory than me. I'm just going to tell everybody this before. So he's going to win this without a doubt. Go on then. (laughs) What is Maria's excuse for not donating her dress to the poor? The poor didn't want that one. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> it's my favourite line in the whole film. <laughs> Congratulations, that is correct. Okay, the real Maria von Trapp appears in the film in a cameo walk-on role. During which mm-hmm. song is she visible on screen? I have confidence. Correct. Yeah, with her daughter and granddaughter. Yes, right. that's yeah. right. Okay, complete the lyrics. So, do, la, fa, mi, do, re. All right, okay. So, do, la, ti, do, re, do. Correct. Yes! <laughs> oh. Woohoo! I was singing it in my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Right. When Maria returns to the Von Trapp home after running away to the Abbey, she is wearing a dress that we have seen another character wearing. Who is that? Oh, my God. Uh, I'm, I'm going to guess Liesel because she gave her a dress at one point. Oh, I don't know though. That is incorrect. It's the new postulant that you see in the abbey. Oh. And then she takes her dress when she leaves. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Fair enough. What does Captain Von Trapp cite as the moment he first fell in love with Maria? When she sat on that silly pine cone. Yes, I'll accept. Ridiculous pine cone. Ridiculous yes. pine cone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, which Von Trapp child does Maria forget in her prayers? Kurt. Yes, correct. Marta tells Maria that she'll soon be turning seven years old, but what specifically does she say she wants as a gift? A pink parasol. Correct. (laughs) Which sister at the Abbey did Maria so often get in disagreements with that she's taken to kissing the floor whenever she saw her coming? Oh, God. Uh, It's one of my favourite lines as well, but I can't remember if it's one of the names that you hear about a few times or whether it's someone completely different. (laughs) Is there an Agatha? There isn't. No, I don't know. It's Sister Bertha. Ah, that one. Yeah. That one. When Maria asks for advice on how to be a governess, name two of the things that the children tell her to do. Never come to dinner on time. Yep. Um, and 
Something to do with sneezing, always blow your nose or something. Something to do with blowing your nose. I'll give you it. Yeah, always blow your nose during dessert. Ah, right, okay. You could have also heard, tell father to mind his own business and never eat your soup quietly. <laughs> 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 I love this film. <laughs> uh, what was the Baroness's first name? It's Elsa. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Who operates the backdrop scenery during the puppet show? <laughs> Um, I'm having too much fun. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's Marta. It is. Yeah. Okay. Which previous governess had a snake put into her pocket by the children? Uh, oh, this is the snake, isn't it? Um, Helga. Yes. Well done. Oh, I got for that. <laughs> well done. Oh, uh, I love this question. Name one of the three wedding gifts that the Baroness suggests. To the captain um a yacht correct yeah um one for going around the mediterranean or a little one for his bathtub <laughs> that's right yeah <laughs> uh, i would also have accepted a villa in the south of france or a fountain, a fountain pen, pen yeah but you've already got one <laughs> <laughs> okay how long did the last governess stay two hours yes correct yes what is the name of the von trapp family's butler france Correct. While hiding in the abbey, which children are sitting with Maria? Gretel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easy one. And I think it might be one of the boys. You must get all three to get the point. Oh, you're oh, okay. There's three. Mm -hmm. God, that's harsh. Uh, I'm just gonna guess. I'm gonna say that Go on, Louise is there and Kurt's there. Oh, not quite. Louisa is, but Friedrich was the other ah, one. Does that mean no point? No point, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Right. Upon arrival at his home, the Baroness is described by Captain Von Trapp to be six things. Can you name three of them? Oh, God. Um, the perfect hostess. Yeah. Uh, charming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A bitch. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, funny? Because your question was harsh. I'm not going to accept. I'm okay, sorry. What, no. what, what was it then? She's lovely, charming, witty, oh. graceful, the perfect hostess, and in a way, my saviour. Okay. Sorry. Uh... I'm going to be harsh with you there. <laughs> <laughs> what unexpected event happened during the filming of 16 going on 17? Uh, Liesl... Uh, slipped off the bench and she went through the glass pane of the gazebo. Yes, that's correct. And she twisted her ankle, which was mm -hmm. then strapped. Um, another quote question. Mm -hmm. When the children insist that the captain sings with Maria's guitar, mm -hmm. the Baroness leans over to Max and says, why didn't you tell me what? Um, why didn't you tell me to bring my harmonica? Yeah, <laughs> to bring along my harmonica. Uh, again, one of my favourite lines. What was the last song Rogers and Hammerstein ever wrote together? Do you know? Um, I don't know so much about together. I know the last one that he wrote, uh, which was Edelweiss. Correct. Yes. I didn't. I couldn't tell whether they did that one together or not. <laughs> um, what is the name of the traditional dance that Maria tries to teach Kurt at the party? The Lendler. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how old was Charmy and Carr when she played Liesl? She wasn't 16 as she was supposed to be. 21. She was. Yeah. If you climb a mountain and follow a rainbow, what do you do to a stream? Oh, you honestly, that was my last question. I was really pleased with it. You forward a stream. <laughs> you forward a stream. Yeah. Okay, in what decade was the movie set? It's the 1930s. Yes. There are five things that Maria claims to have confidence in. Can you name four of them? Right, sunshine, rain, spring will come again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, nights of peace or slumber. Is that right? No, you could have sunshine, rain, that spring will come again, mm -hmm. confidence alone, and herself. Oh, God. I'm sorry. I deliberately made it four so you couldn't get away with just saying the obvious ones. <laughs> Damn it, that's so cruel. Okay, Sorry. what was the name of the abbey? Uh, it's Nonberg Abbey. <sighs> yeah. And it's the oldest nunnery in the world. 713 AD. All right, smart ask. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Uh, how does Marta describe the Nazi swastika 
after Germany annexes Austria. The spider on it. Yeah, flag with the black spider on it. Yeah. Uh, how old was Julie Andrews when she played Maria? 28. Yes. How old is Louisa? Oh, Jesus, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you've literally just you're taken my questions, but she's 13. Yes. My question leading into that then is how old are the children? All the children. All the children. Right. Liesel is 16. Friedrich is 14. Louisa is 13. Kurt is 11. Mm -hmm. Brigitte is 10. Marta's 6, turning 7. Gretel's 5. Well done. Yeah. Whew. Name six things that the nuns compare Maria to. Oh, God. I can't, like, the song's completely gone out of my head. It's well, that's not absolutely good, is it? completely gone. I hate you for this. Call yourself a fan. I can't. <laughs> is it like the ones where she's this say she's a darling, she's a demon, she's a lamb? Yep, that's three of them. Right. But then the other ones though, the is it a flippity gibbet, a will of a whisper clown? Yep, that's six, I'll give you that. You could also have had the weather, a feather, a riddle, a child, a headache, an angel and a girl. Okay, God, you you, you kinda stumped me on that one for a minute. What colour are the children's play clothes and what are they made out of? I mean, they're kind of like a greeny yellowy. Um, they're sort of greeny yellowy and they're made out of the old drapes that used to hang in a bedroom. Yeah, I will sort of give you that. It's, about, it's like cream, isn't it? Cream and green. A creamy yellow. Yeah, I'll give you that one. Thank you. <laughs> um, during the song I Have Confidence, Maria passes a fountain which she then splashes water back at. But what is the animal spurting the water? No. Oh. God almighty. <laughs> hey, you asked me which three children were hid behind a tombstone. <laughs> <so class. laughs> um, is it a, a horse? It is a horse. Bloody yeah. hell. It is. My God. <laughs> okay, okay. If so is a needle pulling thread, what mm. is la? It's a note to follow, so. Yes, well done. Okay, last question. Mm-hmm. Drinkers of which beverage does Liesel claim to know nothing of? Oh, I've forgotten all the lyrics. <laughs> all the lyrics are gone. Brandies. Yes, it's brandy. Right, okay, so my last question then. Who gives Maria the material to make new clothes? The captain has bought it, but uh, the housekeeper, Frau Schmidt, gives her the material. Yes, there you go. Yay. <laughs> Have you counted yours? Um, 16 you got. You also got 16. No way. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Ooh, I like that. A tie. Congratulations. Congratulations. We're equally uh, fangirl. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I will take that. Like I said, it's not a competition. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm quite happy with that. So, we've done our quiz. Yes. We've figured out that we are both complete geeks for the sound of music yeah so let's um get straight into our background so my first question to you matt is what is your personal relationship with the sound of music when and where did you first see it do you remember and what do you rate it yeah no i absolutely remember i remember it specifically because my dad sat me and my sister down and said we're going to watch this now it's one of your grandma's favorites it's one of my favorites kind of thing mm -hmm. Uh, I think he probably noticed, you know, when I said I like nannies and nuns. Mm -hmm. Already big fan of Sister Act of Mary Poppins. <laughs> and I think he took that opportunity and thought, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to introduce you to this film. And I think it's one of the only films really that was ever like formally introduced to me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's particularly quite special for that reason. Oh. That was about four or five, I think. So. <laughs> okay. So for me, I cannot remember a time when I hadn't seen it. So it must mm. have been before I like officially formally made memories <laughs> I can't <laughs> actually remember I've just always known about it there's a yeah. uh, there's a family video on Christmas day um and my brother's a baby so I must have been three uh, maybe I'd have just turned four yeah um and there was a sound of music documentary on the telly in the background and my mum was saying look that so and so and mm. and I you know I knew all about it <laughs> so yeah. It's so, like, one of those films that's just made up the type of person I am, the type of films mm -hmm. that I watch, the type of music that I like. Yeah, it sort of finds its way into your DNA. Yeah, it's, like, pivotal. It's all you've ever known, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, 
Um, I've been doing lots and lots of research into the background. I read an entire book <laughs> just about the sound of music. So I've, I've got a few bits of background fact. Yes. So the real Maria was born in 1905 on a train bound for Vienna. Yeah. Georg's wife, his first wife, was called Agatha and she died of scarlet fever and she left him with seven children, uh, Rupert, Agatha, Maria, Werner, Hedwig, Joanna and Martina. You can see already. Obviously, <laughs> they not... did not like the names. Yes. Not one of the names remained in the movie. Um, Maria went to the Von Trapp Villa in 1926 and she married Georg in 1927. And they had three children, Rosemary, Eleanor and Johannes. Mm -hmm. They did win the Salzburg Music Festival in 1936. And in yeah. 1938, they did not actually climb over a mountain into Switzerland. No, they boarded a train. <laughs> yes, they got on a train to Italy. And eventually they ended up in America where they settled in Vermont and toured around the country performing for many years. By the time that they left Austria, they weren't children anymore either. They were all grown up. So, yeah. so the facts are a bit different. Ever slightly different. Yeah, I think there's always been a bit of a question mark, and I think we all kind of knew it, but we didn't like to admit it because we liked the film very yeah. so much. But the inaccuracies, or the liberties that were taken with the story, artistic license. <laughs> yeah, and and not just from the real story, mm -hmm. but also from her her memoirs yeah. into the musical and, and the German film that was done. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's sort of been revised so many times. The bare bones are still correct. But yeah, it's, it's totally it's different. It's a much more fairy tale version mm -hmm. that sort of works for entertainment purposes as yeah. well. So like you've just said, two German films were made mm -hmm. and the rights were eventually bought out um, so that the Broadway musical could be made. And that was written by Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss. They were very mm -hmm. successful at the time. Uh, and they brought Rodgers and Hammerstein on board to write the score and the songs. And obviously they'd already had success with Carousel and Oklahoma and South Pacific and The King and I. So they were like, you know, they were the guys to go to at mm -hmm. the time. Um, and it was the last thing that Oscar Hammerstein wrote um, mm. because he died in 1960. It was the last song, as we said in the quiz, was Edelweiss, yeah. um, which has actually become so linked with Austria that um, it has been many times mistakenly <laughs> thought it was the national anthem, including yeah. by the president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, uh, which is quite <laughs> embarrassing, really, isn't it? Yeah, um, it's convincing. Yeah, <laughs> it's very convincing. It should be. Yeah. They should just swap it. It's so nice. Oh, I don't see why not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the Broadway show opened in November of 1959 with Mary Martin in the leading role, and it was a smash hit, which obviously meant that they were going to make a movie out mm -hmm. of it. So they got Ernest Lehman. He'd written Sabrina with Audrey Hepburn. He'd written Hitchcock's North by Northwest. And he went on after the sound of music to write uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. But he mm -hmm. had particular musical experience already because he'd written the screenplays for The King and I and West Side Story, um, which meant he'd already worked with director Robert Wise. Yeah. So they already knew each other and had a relationship. So he came in and then started looking for Maria. Yeah. And they finally looked into julie andrews who richard mm. rogers really wanted well they watched footage from mary poppins didn't they before it came out and after five minutes robert wise turned and said let's go and sign her now before somebody else beats us to it yeah because mary poppins wasn't out yet she was still completely brand new yes. to the screen at least nobody knows who she is at this point now obviously when the film came out mary poppins had already been out smash hit oscar winner you know, mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's all that. But beforehand, when they were looking into it in 1963, they were still, you know, they'd just made Mary Poppins and they were working in post-production. So nobody knew who she was unless you were no. a fan of musical theatre. But um, she just had it. She just kind of came out of the blue, didn't oh, she? Yeah. And she had two very successful consecutive years. Yes. Yeah. So so she was just it, wasn't she? Mm. Um, yeah. So I, I would say that kind of leads us into the performances and the characters mm -hmm. so yeah um i don't know about you but i just can't imagine anybody else as maria for this no it, it wouldn't she brings more than just acting talent yeah. she's got a whole sort of uh, just an aura about her hasn't she she's mm -hmm. she's magical she's a magical person and yeah she's one of a kind really isn't she oh she is absolute national treasure i just absolutely adore her she's just got that voice yeah oh 
it's just perfect perfect yeah for it. perfect is probably the, the proper word oh god yeah she couldn't do any wrong no. like, no matter what she says or does even today reading the book i've just read like it they said so many times about her professionalism like yeah. you just made it all look so easy she put so much work into it and really really worked hard but she just made it look effortless and that's maybe why she didn't win the oscar for the sound of music maybe although she hadn't been on the screen like a whole lot i mean Mm -hmm. especially at this point she had actually been performing and you know yeah she had a career you Mm -hmm. know in terms of stage and, and singing for quite a long time so i imagine this was just like Although I'm sure she was having a marvellous time. (laughs) It was still a job and she took it seriously because that was her work ethic. Mm -hmm. But it's just great that she brought along her personality as well. And everyone just seems to love her. Even the people on set who weren't very happy to be there. There's a a story about the kids, um, especially uh, Nicholas Hammond, who played Friedrich, who Mm. has openly said he just adored her. And you can actually see it in the film. There are moments when he's looking at her with complete awe. Yeah. But then you've obviously got the other side of that, which is um, Christopher Plummer, who, (laughs) yes, did not really enjoy the experience at the time. It sounds like he took a lot of convincing to even take the role anyway, because he said it was not very three-dimensional. No. He said there wasn't a character there at all. So he actually pushed to say, actually, no, can you work with Maria von Trapp and (laughs) the real one? He worked with Ernest Lehman for a week, actually. He was allowed to go in and work with the screenwriter to improve the part. Yeah. Um, he was like really pleased that he'd been given the opportunity because most actors at the time did not go and work on the script with screenwriters. That just wasn't done. But it still didn't sound like he was completely convinced. No. I mean, he was drunk a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he drank his way through it. He's famous for saying how much the film has sort of inconvenienced him throughout his career. Yeah. Christopher Plummer is like 91 years old this year um, and I think he's mellowed a lot over time. Yeah, he's made peace with it. Well, obviously in his younger days and when he was more, you know, lively and curmudgeonly, shall we say, um, I think it, it bothered him quite a lot. But I think as he's got older and he's kind of come to terms with actually what it is. And after he's said, actually, it wasn't that bad because <laughs> he could see the joy that it brought. Yeah. What about the Baroness, mm. Eleanor Parker? I, I, it's one of those you like her more and more, I think, as you get older. Do you know what? I think you need to be an adult to get it. Yeah. It's easy to think she's just evil. Yeah. Like, oh, she's she's trying to get in the way of the relationship. But she was there first. And they were engaged. Yeah. And to be honest, <laughs> you know, my favourite scene of hers is when she leaves um Mm. she's talking all about the you know the honeymoon and the presents and stuff Mm. but then when she realizes that he's going to dump her yeah she's very graceful and she just bows out quite a strong moment yeah oh god yeah and i I, you feel really sorry but i think you need to be an adult to get it yeah it's it's totally comes with with age and she actually did it so well Mm. She really did. All the way through, she's just trying to save face, really, so that she doesn't look humiliated, which, I mean, you would be, wouldn't you? Watching it recently, having not seen it for a couple of years now, I noticed so much more, like, the little looks and yeah. the little glances that she had, not even to anybody in particular, but mm-hmm. just to herself, thinking, something's not right here. Yeah. You know, the dynamic changes completely when you're an adult. And you yeah. Think, oh, actually, yeah. Well, she was very highly thought of as an actress, Eleanor Parker. She was. Yeah, she did uh, a lot. She'd done things with Robert Wise before, which is why he mm-hmm. picked her for the role. But I've never seen her in anything else. I've got to admit, but no, I really would have liked to. She's, I love her voice. She's got a fabulous voice. She's got like three Oscar nominations. Well, she had yeah three Oscar nominations. I think she actually did great things with that part. Yeah, it's one of my favourite characters, actually. Yeah. And she was very funny um, with Richard Hayden, who played Max Detweiler. Yes. Um, they, they're like a little double act in parts. Yeah. Um, He's a proper character actor. Uh, known yeah. For doing like very, not silly parts, but, he, you know, comic relief parts. Yeah, you know, yeah. Lots of silly voices that he used to put on. Yeah, well, yeah, he actually did the, um, the Caterpillar voice in um, Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Which I yeah. had no idea about. And I, my mind is blown. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> had no idea. He brings comic relief, but also, Mm. I think at the end, there are serious parts to it. 
there's a lot on the line for him. He yeah. He could get in serious trouble for what he did. Yeah. He's not real, obviously. but <laughs> And he's also the other part, like the other view of the politics. Because all you yeah. see is Christopher Plummer's view of, like, you know, loving Austria, hating the Germans and everything that's going on. So but then you've very got... Vocal that he has no political convictions mm-hmm. whatsoever. And he's that other view, he's that other side. Because there will have been a lot of people like that. I vote we have a sequel. We need a sequel. <laughs> What happened to Max afterwards? Because surely, like, the Nazis were a bit like, oh, you're mm. quite close to this family and they've just escaped. Yeah. Oh, that could be a bit dark. Oh, yeah. Mm. To see what would happen to this fictional character. Yeah. It would be quite interesting. Very dark. He had some very good lines as well. You like him, don't you? Even though he actually, to be honest, he's a little bit... He's a bit of a swindler, isn't he? <laughs> On the yeah. line. He's, like, talking yeah. to the Baroness about shipping off the children to a boarding school. And, mm. <laughs> like, yeah. I'd, I want to see you both put your money together. I want you to be rich, which will make me rich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? How are they friends? <laughs> that's one thing that's never really explained is what connection mm. does he have <laughs> with yeah. the family? And, but I guess he puts on the folk festivals and stuff, so he must have some mm. connections. But I've always wondered, who is he? And as a very small child, when they refer to him as Uncle Max, I was like, I'm a bit confused now because you don't always join the dots to that he's not a real uncle. But yeah. it never bothered me that he wasn't in the end. <laughs> Well, we all grow up with that uncle and aunt that aren't really uncle and aunts, don't we? Until yeah. you actually get older and you're like, they're not actually at all. They're not related no. to me. And then you have to revise everything you've ever known yes. about your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imposter. <laughs> okay. So uh, should we talk about the kids? Mm, I like, yeah. I just, I love the kids. Yeah. I think what really works is that you could tell, A, they were having the time of their lives. Uh, yeah. Um, they were basically on holiday. And the film itself is partially a summer holiday for the children mm-hmm. as well. So them going out and about and on all these excursions and stuff. Yeah. But the other thing is what you said earlier about Friedrich looking up to Maria. And I think the reason they're such a convincing family is because they just thought she was incredible and they mm-hmm. just loved being around her. And that's what made those relationships so authentic on screen because yeah. it, was, it was actually happening there was a lot of downtime as well like while they were trying to make it um especially mm. while they were in austria because it was it's like is it the seventh highest rainfall yes. <laughs> <laughs> in the world um so there was a lot of downtime where they just couldn't film uh, and she pretty much kind of kept everybody going so not only was she yeah. doing her own job but she was making sure that the cast and crew were you know uplifted mm. and but they're grown up now. Like, I mean, two well, two of them have died, haven't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. They're all in the sixties, seventies now, and they're not kids. They've had kids. They've got grandchildren. They've gone on to do other things. But mm-hmm. to an extent, they are frozen in time. They're stuck there. They've got to be like the world's most famous fictional family. I think so. Yeah. And I think it's been a little bit difficult for some of them at times mm. because yeah. they've just never been able to get away from that. Yeah, you can't shake it off. Yeah. But I think some of them have done really well to just mm. embrace it and they've really sort of took it in their stride. And they all love each other. Yeah, that's it. They became a, a family. family. Yeah. Some of the interviews and stuff you listen to is like they were like brothers and sisters. They were all at each other's weddings, funerals, divorces, hard times in their life. They've all, you know, flew in from wherever they were in the world. Mm. There's very few of the stories like this. Yeah, there aren't, and you just don't, I mean, you hear some films, you know, oh, there was a connection, blah, 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 but, like, this is, like, to a different extent, it's, like, yeah. it's been 55 years, and they're still, like, all together. Yeah, that just goes to show that it was a once-in-a-lifetime thing, yeah. nothing like it has really happened before or since. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something really special about watching these people, because you feel like you know them. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It works. Again, it, that's part of the magic of it, isn't it, because it's just absolutely in everybody's mind you can picture scenes you know the songs you know the, mm-hmm. the lines the, the, the script you, you just know it mm. and it's their innocence I think is what pushes it to generation to generation to generation I know Christopher Plummer thinks it's saccharine and it's too mm. sweet and even Julie Andrews said it was too sweet mm. so they really have to sort of tone it down from the musical by the sound of it yeah but that's what's made it transfer through every generation since yeah people went to see it multiple times it was actually out the original film four years it ran for before they took it off yeah Yeah, four years can you imagine i mean i can't even like the biggest films now avengers and avatar (laughs) it's what six months if that 
and that's a long yeah. time four years even overseas like yeah. two two and a half years mm -hmm the global appeal of it all. Mm -hmm. But one thing, in addition to the characters and the actors, it's Austria itself. Yeah. It's, it, it's like a postcard advert almost for that. And you feel like you oh. know the places. I've never been. I want to go. Yeah, it's on my bucket list. Well, that leads very nicely into locations and things. Too. Yeah. I think one of the reasons it's one of the only classical films that I actively gravitate to and has stuck with me so much is because it breaks out of the constraints of the studios yeah. i know a lot of it is filmed within studios and it was filmed at fox in mm -hmm. in the us but the fact that so much of it is on location and they really make use of it yeah um, that they go everywhere yeah that for me is great and it's great that a musical of that mm -hmm. time really took the opportunity to expand and open the story up and do that well that was part of its success and and it was groundbreaking for the time because as a rule at mm -hmm. that time you made movies on a back lot yeah you know that's how it was done and this film broke ground it oh, it's just it's picture perfect isn't it absolutely yeah. gorgeous you start to feel like you know the geography of it all mm -hmm. the sets as well like the von trapp villa yeah um you feel like it's all one existing location but actually the front and the back were different and the terrace was different yeah. to the lake yeah the rooms were different to the main hallway and it was stitched basically between two different continents but you believe that it exists the editor william reynolds was kind of first class because yeah. you just do not know it's so seamless and he went on to do the godfather he'd made hello dolly the mm -hmm. sting complete professional um knew exactly what to do with this musical mm -hmm. it was a very experienced production team it really was overall and a lot of them had worked together before which i think helps yeah which again makes it a family experience because they all know each other um, yeah yeah you look at some of the films that these guys have done and you think, oh, my God, they, they'd worked on amazing pieces of work. Yeah, they just go on and on it's and on. Ridiculous. Like I said, that's what I really like about it is that they didn't just recreate the set. Yeah. Put the camera down static and just film the scene because that's what I didn't like about watching The King and I. Yeah. You could have just filmed the stage version and it would have been mm -hmm. exactly the same. But they use the medium of film to advance the story yeah. to deepen the characters mm -hmm. to showcase a whole city or a country i guess you could say yeah um say like the do re mi sequence mm -hmm. it's quite a static number on the stage mm -hmm. but on the screen it's a whole montage i think one person even said it's like the first music video it was it was it went everywhere and it was used to show not just the children learning to sing but it shows the children developing over time and getting to know maria over time because yeah. of the way it was all stitched together when they were doing do re mi they literally didn't know it was going to work they were like oh, yeah. well, i'm not sure about this this it's there's so much mm -hmm. editing in they, they weren't sure they could pull it off mm -hmm. and when the editor got it all together he was like no this is going to be really special yeah would this be a good opportunity to talk about the choreography that went with it? Yes. Um, what I think is great <laughs> is that there was a heck of a lot of storyboarding oh, yeah. involved in the whole film. Um, but mm -hmm. every single beat of most songs, especially yeah. Do Re Mi, it's clockwork precision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And working with very young children as well can't have been easy, but it's satisfying to watch. And I think that's also part of the appeal. It's not yeah. just watching people willy nilly just sort of skipping about. They mm -hmm. are skipping and they are cycling and running and hump. I've written in my notes humping. And I think I meant jumping <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and riding bikes. They just went above and beyond. And it's not just that sequence mm -hmm. either, but you look at something like 16 going on 17. Yeah imagine all the things you could possibly do within a gazebo within reason jumping the running spinning yeah. and twirling and lifts they did it and i really like this pair they're the husband and wife team behind the mary poppins choreography as well so they'd worked with julie andrews yes and yeah i just love how in every aspect of the film they made full use of the resources that they had they also did um chitty chitty bang bang as well oh i see uh, yeah which is another fantastic one they don't do musical set pieces quite like that anymore. I think no. that La La Land did it, didn't they? And they kind of brought that back. Yeah. But it's just not really done like that anymore. That's no. so old school. Um, but it's kind of what makes those musicals from that time so special. Even the likes of My Favourite Things. Yeah. It's on a bed, but it's all choreographed, the whole yeah. thing. 
there's a lot of people in the scene as well mm. uh, any given time obviously there's about there's usually eight yeah and it just it just works it, it feels perfect mm-hmm. it's not always when you look closely but <laughs> but it you know it feels perfect on top of that mm-hmm. um the cinematography is mm. absolutely stunning i mean just look at a film still from the mm-hmm. sound of music and it is like a piece of art yeah. it's either outside and it's gorgeous in the hills and you've got that or you've got um something good it in mm-hmm. the shadow it's gorgeous it's brilliant it's a stunning film to actually look at and it's yeah. so colorful it's a real testament to what you can do with cinematography yeah and again the professionalism who they had on board movies don't look like that anymore no. I think that's one of the reasons I like older movies. Um, just something about it, it's I find really striking. It just mm-hmm. really sits with me. I think it is nice to have something that feels old and classic. Yeah. But also vibrant and new at the same time. And I think that's why The Sound of Music works for me, because it's just on that cusp of mm-hmm. old and new. Yeah. And as a result, it transcends both. Yeah. Well, that word, vibrant, that is technicolor. So you think of the likes of, like, the Wizard of Oz, mm-hmm. the sound of music, that they're, they're so colourful. I kind of feel like cinema's washed out now. I think if you were to do it now, it would come across as fake. Yeah. Like now everything's like so devoid of colour. And then when you look at these movies, you go, oh, yeah. it's all bright and, and vibrant is, is definitely the word. We should probably then mention the songs and the score. Oh. Most of the songs came over from the musical. Mm-hmm. Um, they dropped a couple of them. Um, they did. Which I think makes sense. I mean, I haven't actually heard them before and I've never seen the stage musical, but from the descriptions that I've seen and the titles of the song, yeah. I've kind of gone, yeah, that wouldn't have fit. But instead they came up with I Have Confidence and mm-hmm. Something Good, which you've just mentioned, the yeah. sort of love scene at the end with Maria and the captain. I'll be honest, I don't think I want to see the stage show no me neither. it's never been one i've wanted to see and with other things I, i've been like oh well i love the movie so I, i'll see that yeah but for this i do not want to see the stage play because i don't i don't want it to be different i don't want to see something different i like it exactly as it is i have to say for me the music is just it's my favorite musical yes same um in terms of score and music the sound of music is at the top. No, I agree with you. I, I, why though? Why? Why are the songs so good? What is it? There's obviously some kind of special formula because every song is amazing. Well, Rodgers and Hammerstein, I think, were just absolutely fantastic. They were such a good team. You look mm-hmm. at any of the music from any of the films that they've made, and I mean, they got better, I think, with age. So they started off with, um, yeah. you had um, State Fair and Carousel. Um, mm-hmm. And they were mm, so-so. And then you had Oklahoma, which was that little bit better again. Yeah. Um, be like one good song. Oh, What a Beautiful Morning, which was the standout. Yeah. And then by the next film, they had two good songs. Yeah. King and I. <laughs> and then you have South Pacific, which it was, was huge at the time, 1958. So it, they got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then obviously, unfortunately, Oscar Hammerstein died. Yeah. But, I'm not sure they would have been able to carry on after that. Yeah, they wouldn't have been able to top it. Well, not just that, but I think the times were changing. That kind of prototype, perfect family, you know, innocence was going. I just don't think after that they would have survived the change anyway. The 60s were, you know, it all became about the counterculture, the studio mm-hmm. system collapsed. Yeah. And you got these more anti-hero based stories mm-hmm. like you say Bonnie and Clyde, Easy Rider, all those things and much more violent films, much more graphic films. The yeah. language was bad, nudity was um, present and yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it, it wouldn't have worked and again it, that's when I say The Sound of Music was a very specific moment in time between two very different worlds, I guess. One of the reasons it was as successful as it was, which we'll talk about later, um, is because the times were changing and people wanted to keep going back to that innocence. And they were using the film as escapism. That's why people saw it again and again and again. Yeah, and they still do, regardless of the context. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
But one of the things that we've asked this week, we've put out a poll to everybody to find out what their favourite song is, but we won't say what it is just yet. But I have to say, I, at one point, I'm pretty sure it was like an eight-way tie <laughs> <laughs> between the 11 songs, like the major yeah. songs. Um, I have to say there's only one that got no votes. Really? Which one was that? Yeah, it's one of the new ones. It's one of the ones that Richard Rogers wrote after. So, yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally but, understand. Yeah, but apart from that, Every other song was at least one person's favourite that we asked. Yeah. I don't think we would have gotten that with any other musical that we would put out as a poll. No, no, it's perfectly understandable as well because every song is has got something. Yeah. You end up listening to the whole thing because yeah. it's it's you can't turn it off. Yeah. They're completely infectious. Mm-hmm. Like we said earlier, not only are they part of your DNA now when you've seen the film so many times, mm-hmm. but they're just woven into the fabric of our lives and our culture and it's just everybody knows them yeah and everybody loves them Mm -hmm. Uh, the lyrics and the melodies they just work so well together they they perfectly fit um and it's not very often you can say that you'll maybe like the lyrics of a song or or a little bit of a song yeah um or you'll like that little bit of melody to a song Mm -hmm. oh that's a lovely bit of song that um but these like all of them it's the whole package it works it's never happened i don't think in any other musical no not for me not no for me. me neither um the other thing as well is the it's the orchestration of the score yeah then you are a huge fan of erwin Costell then because mm. he was the orchestrator it's brilliant and, i mean he excelled himself doing that he'd also done west side story and mary poppins and he did bed knobs and broomsticks as well so he had a lot of musical experience yeah but i mean the way he put this together was just fabulous yeah you can listen to the score <laughs> on its own i i could just listen to the lendler yeah or the prelude to the sound of music i mean that builds and it builds and it builds and you just it's so uplifting yeah it's incredibly done absolute genius it really works Mm -hmm. okay so speaking of the film working (laughs) yeah should we talk about its um success yes and reactions to it so as we said it's 55th anniversary it was i think the 2nd of march or something like that it Mm -hmm. it was released yeah and it blew people away the critics hated it yeah i mean they absolutely scathed it 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 was terribly reviewed Mm. um but it it just kept making money and audiences Mm. loved it you know people were going to see it in droves and Mm. then seeing it again and again and again um so i've looked this up because Mm. people have said it is one of the most seen films of all time okay um so i've looked up what the adjusted box office would be okay it's worldwide gross like at the time was like 159 million Okay. But that adjusted now for today's ticket prices is one point four one billion dollars. <laughs> yeah. So that's over all of the movies that we know have been yeah. successful recently have made. It was unprecedented. One of the things that I was really quite fascinated to read about, I did think in the back of my head, I wonder what Austrians thought of the film. Mm, and, yeah. <laughs> what I was surprising to learn was that either they haven't seen it, mm-hmm. refuse to see it, or they hate it. Yeah. Because to them, it's so inaccurate and it alters something that was yeah. so like part of their modern history yeah but at the same time because of the topic of nazi history as well it's a little yeah. bit taboo a lot of them deny austria's involvement with the third reich and exactly like yeah um when the director robert wise was faced with opposition about using the swastikas in the film and staging yeah. scenes that looked nazi-ish he made them change their minds when he threatened to actually use the real footage of them applauding hitler yeah. coming through the town <laughs> the anschluss in austria it was not a hostile takeover at all. Um, they were very welcoming of it. Most of the population were very welcoming. And like you said, waved him in, cheering, smiling. It was like a procession. But that was what they were embarrassed about because of the film, because obviously they were very, very much in denial for a number of years. Mm, yeah. You needed to get further generations away from it, the ones that didn't remember or couldn't recall the war. It was only, I say only, 73 years after the real Von Trapps fled the country did the first production of the musical take place in Salzburg. 
Yeah, that's right. And even then, I don't know how they felt about it. <laughs> <laughs> that leads us on to how the Von Trapps felt about it as well, because mm. I think, again, they have a very conflicted view of it because i mean three of the children haven't been talked about at all yeah. um, all of the children's names were changed ages were changed mm-hmm. um stories were changed in reality georg von trapp was quite a nice mm-hmm. man there was music in the house before yeah, he had a violin there. yeah <laughs> They all played musical instruments. and yeah. So I think they had a, quite a hard relationship. Some of them completely disregarded the whole thing. I think they had a very difficult relationship with their mother. Maria was yeah. very... She was a strict one. Yeah, she was yeah. a very difficult woman, very religious, and she, she was hard work by the yeah. sounds of it. Not that we mean to destroy the illusion. <laughs> yeah. A couple of the 10 children just mm-hmm. moved away completely and didn't want anything to do with the whole thing. Yeah. I guess it's like the whole world seeing you for completely different, you know. Yeah, and they think they know you. That's right, yeah. It's so strange that we've talked for so long about what's great about the film, mm-hmm. but at the same time we're talking about what was so damaging about the film. Yeah. So it was very successful, though, overall. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, awards wise it was nominated for 10 Oscars it won 5 it won Best Picture Best Director Music which of course it won music sound and editing um, mm-hmm. but what about the legacy why do you think the film works like what is it oh it's a combination of everything we've discussed it's the music it's the cast it's the cinematography it's the costuming music acting editing sound it's the whole thing Mm -hmm. um it's one of those magical moments and there aren't a lot um you have those few they were made at the perfect time by the right people in the right way and the timing just all fit and what they created was this package that has stood the test of time because of what it is it's gorgeous and it and it's what it stands for and the music's so lively and it's you can show your kids yeah and i think the main thing about it is that the film connects you to your childhood whether or not you watch the film Mm -hmm. as a child like it takes you back to that time and what kid did not watch the sound of music as a child yeah (laughs) but i guess the other thing as well it's the music itself it's called Mm -hmm. the sound of music i guess after all and it's kind of Mm -hmm. Maria heals a broken family through music like she liberates them with music and imagination Mm -hmm. and creativity so I guess that's kind of like a whole another layer about the universality of music and what it can do and how it can bring people together and and that it exists around us every day Mm -hmm. I mean even in the opening you know she's just singing about the music that she hears in nature you know it's just Mm -hmm. it's kind of unexplainable isn't it why does music work why does music make us think and feel a certain way Part of the legacy of the sound of music is the sing along. Have you have you been to a sing along of the sound of music? I I have actually. I need to. I've got something. <laughs> Words can't describe how much I detest the sort of fandomship for any film that manifests itself in <laughs> sing alongs and dressing up. I can't <laughs> stand. I have been to a sound of music sing along when I was at university, okay. um, and it's. I, I don't actually, I've, like I said, I've got a terrible memory, so I can't <laughs> actually remember a lot about it. But I, you were given a little pack okay. um, with a little bit of fake Edelweiss. <laughs> and like certain little, certain, there's like little bits in, in that you're given that are representative of like certain words and songs and things like that. And mm-hmm. you get your Edelweiss out when there's, so, you know, stuff like that when Edelweiss is playing. And there's certain bits that, that, that you do. Um, um, but you know what? Yes, it's corny. Yeah. I imagine it's fun. Yes, it's such good fun. And the atmosphere is fantastic because you can start off like mocking it. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, it's a bit of fun. It's just stupid, isn't it? But by the time they sit down and you get to the end, it's this pure joy that people are just completely enjoying it, enjoying themselves. And like you said, it's the universality of the music. It might just be me. I think if it was any other musical, I'd probably be more open to mm-hmm. the idea of it not necessarily going myself but just you know i understand why yeah. people do it. and i do understand why people do it and I, and I get it's probably great fun but i can't help feel that especially with the sound of music going and then singing over the top of it <laughs> sort of cheapens the craft and the beauty of the film oh, to try and imitate it is almost an insult do you know what i mean you can't recreate it you can't recreate it. it's bringing everybody together to enjoy it see i watch um... it alone in seclusion <laughs> 
I've, I've actually written in front of me here. I mostly refuse to watch the film with others in the fear that it'll either be ruined or that they will sing over the top of it. <laughs> we'll never watch it with me, Matt. No, because I cannot. I cannot watch the film without singing along. I watched a documentary. It was Sue Perkins who did it, and she went to Austria and she was on the coach tour going around the locations, and they're all singing "Do Re Mi" so badly, and it's just cringeworthy. Just don't. <laughs> I have to ask the question then, Matt. Yes, would you like to know the results of our poll? Yeah, I, I have to know. I have to know. Two questions. One question was, what is your favourite song from The Sound of Music? We struggled. Thank you, by the way, for everyone who voted. We had to keep reopening the poll in different formats because we had ties throughout. <laughs> I regret to tell you that we still have ties in this question. So, <laughs> oh dear. Joint third place. Oh God. Is The Lonely Goat Herd. And Edelweiss, which I'm quite pleased to see, got quite high up. Hmm. Okay. Runner-up is 16 going on 17. Oh, mm-hmm. well, I'm surprised. And joint first. I think we're going to be quite pleased here because I think your choice, Do Re Mi. Yay! <laughs> and my choice, The Sound of Music, came out on top. Oh, I'm quite happy, yeah. That combined results across survey monkey facebook twitter and instagram so but to be honest like i said every song apart from something good got a vote mm-hmm. the other question that we had going on that we haven't actually mentioned it's a good way to round off the episode i guess yes is we wanted to know where the sound of music ranked out of everyone's favorite film musicals overall yes just to give you a rundown of how many different films are considered people's favorites uh, little shop of horrors rocky horror sound of music lay Miz, mary poppins greatest showman la la land seven brides for seven brothers oliver mamma mia annie west side story greece chicago and it goes on even yeah. moulin rouge in here so wow we eventually got a clear first second and third place okay in third place is the rocky horror picture show wow yeah i think a lot more people like that than i thought yeah actually yeah i'm mm-hmm. surprised so in second place again i'm quite surprised is la la land no way yeah wow uh-huh if we were to rephrase the question and say greatest of all time it might be slightly different yeah maybe la la land's quite fresh in people's minds yes I th- maybe yeah Still got beat by Moonlight. But okay, first <laughs> first place then. Okay. I don't think you're gonna be very happy. Oh god, why? First place is Le Miserable. Oh for goodness sake, people. <laughs> Come on, people. I can I can personally see it. I wouldn't have put it there myself. Oh, can't see it. So the sound of music didn't even make the top three. No. Um well that is de- that's terrible. Uh, it made the fourth spot. Oh god. Les Mis. It's not that bad. The music's really good, but the film's just forgettable. It was miscast and it was, yeah. I would love to see the stage, though. Oh, yeah. Apparently yeah. that's fantastic, and I completely believe it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do like some of the music from it quite a lot. Mm. But I did not rate the film at all. I was extremely disappointed. Oh, I didn't. I didn't hate it. I quite liked it. But again, it was my first sort of visual access point for that. I knew some of the songs already, but that was the first yeah. kind of impression that I got from it. I am disappointed. Never I mind. wanted the sound of music. <laughs> well, we asked. You told. Us. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you for voting. You're all wrong. You shouldn't have bothered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm a bit sad that the sound of music so far down, but mm. I think people do love it. It's just yeah. maybe not necessarily the go to or maybe they love the songs but not necessarily would choose to put the film on. I don't know. It's a long film. That might be why. <laughs> well, there's an intermission, so you can always do it in two halves. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise I think that wraps just about everything up. It does. With the sound of music. <laughs> We've got one little bit of, well, very serious big news. Would you like to do the honours, Matt? Yeah, of course. Um, We had planned to have a very in-depth James Bond episode just in time for uh, the 25th outing, No Time to Die, in April. But you may have seen on the news that 
due to coronavirus and a lot of cinemas being closed, especially in the Far East. Um, they've chosen to push back the release by about six or seven months or so. So it's looking more to be October, November time that that's actually going to come out. So while it's good news for us in a way, because we can spend more time maybe watching some of the films back, um, we're just shifting our schedule ever so slightly. <laughs> um, yes. So that's mainly our big news of the week because mm. it affects not just the cinema world, but ourselves as well. So It does. I mean, and it is big news. I've no, I can't say I've ever heard of that kind of thing happening before. No. It, that, that's new to me yeah um i do wonder whether they're taking an opportunity to maybe do some more tweaks on it or something at the same maybe. time because they will have the time to do it i think a lot of it's fairly precautionary health wise oh yeah um but i think a lot of it's a financial standpoint really isn't it it looks like they've taken quite a big hit like about 30 million pounds yeah in delaying it but in the long run the revenue that they could get later on from having a bigger opening mm, yeah probably balance it out mm-hmm and more people might be ready for it then as well. And not that we weren't yeah. already, but we'll be anticipating it even more. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want to tell everyone what we've got in store in terms of trailers? Well, now that we're working with the lovely people at cinechat.co.uk, um, we have started doing a weekly kind of review of trailers. Would you call hmm. it that, Matt? It's like a roundup with commentary. Yes. So um, so each week we are picking a number of uh, trailers for us to comment on. And you'll, you'll see our comments and, and what the other members of the group have said. Um, so we've got the likes of coming up um, Antebellum. Mm. Uh, we've got Greyhound, the new Tom Hanks War trailer. The English Game, which is a new Netflix one. We've got Artemis Fowl. Uh, connected the new animation um from the guys who made spider-man into the spider-verse so that'll be an interesting one yep um sea fever uh, and uh, scooby-doo zoinks <laughs> yeah it's a quite a varied group mm. for this new week so if you want to um see what our reactions to that are you just need to go to www.cinechat.co.uk yeah if you just go to the trailer chat tab you'll find it on there and we've also uh, got on there our previous one our very first one that we've done as a big group uh, mm -hmm. things like Candyman, uh, Blythe Spirit, The Secret Garden and the Wes Anderson film The French Dispatch which is coming out later this year as well mm. so yeah and that'll be every week yes I like doing that yeah I'm enjoying it yeah it's a good way of mapping out what's going to be on your radar for the year yeah and uh, obviously as well um, it's not just the trailers that are on there you've got um you've got the reviews on there as well mm -hmm. um so there's been recent reviews on the invisible man um i recently did one on dark waters mm, yeah um so they're very up to date with with um with the films that are coming out there'll be an onward um review That's coming on. up very soon oh is it already on it's there wow yeah. it's there so see what i mean they're, they're more up to date than i am yeah um <laughs> so yeah it's worth checking out mm -hmm. amazing would you like to recommend a film this week? I would, actually. Oh, I watched it last night at oh, okay. 10 o'clock. <laughs> um, so I sat and watched Britney Runs a Marathon. Oh, yes. Heard of that one. Do you know what? I really loved it. Okay. I really, really did love it. It really talks about size um, and how you feel about your body and how you feel about yourself um representations of people some films really don't do it justice and don't do it well and there's been a few of those um amy schumer for instance got she did i feel pretty didn't she yeah, yeah and that didn't go down too well but this was just um it just really worked mm -hmm. it was very aspirational and it had some really funny moments some really hard moments to watch um yeah i, I really enjoyed it really enjoyed it so i would definitely recommend that one uh, it almost made me want to go for a run <laughs> oh, i don't know if it'll have that effect on me <laughs> i was thinking about it last night now i've woke up and slept on it i'm less likely to go out i think but um it nearly did i'm a big fan of sitting down <laughs> yeah <laughs> what's your recommendation for the week um it's a funny one really because i can't really describe any of the plot to you um <laughs> I, I was very excited to watch this i'm so glad i finally got around to it it's a film called waves oh yeah 
So this came out in January, I think, for the UK. And it's by Trey Edward Schultz, who did It Comes at Night, if anyone knows that horror film that he did a few years ago. This is only his third film. All I can really say is set in Florida, um, and it focuses on a sort of suburban family unit that is completely shaken by a tragic event, which I can't, I'm not saying anything. It hits you. It's a proper gut-punching film. Um, So rather than telling you what happens in the plot, Overall, ultimately, the film deals with themes of, you know, the fragility of life, um, the idea that, you know, life's too short not to live it to the full or to live it without learning to forgive yourself and others. It's a very life affirming film and as well as being utterly devastating in parts, it really stays with you uh, and the style is incredible. It's something that could very easily have been done very run of the mill, but it's not. It's the camera work and the lighting and the use of colours, especially. It's, it's spectacular. It's like watching a dream, and at times it's like watching a nightmare, but it never doesn't feel real. It's hard to describe, and the characters are complex and they're imperfect, and it works so well. The performances are fantastic. Um, Kelvin Harrison Jr. was nominated for the um, Rising Star Award at the BAFTAs. He didn't win. Mm. I think he definitely should have done. Sterling K. Brown's great in this. Lucas Hedges as well. Um, in particular, I thought they were all outstanding. Whew, it's wow. great. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's one hell of a recommendation, isn't it? Yeah. I, I really hope I really hope you watch it and I hope you like it. If you didn't enjoy Moonlight, this is maybe another avenue into a similar type of film. I have to give it a go. I have heard that it's been very highly critically reviewed, mm. but I don't know anything about it. No, I've decided not to give anything away. So go into it blind then, basically. Yeah, I'd recommend watching it as soon as you can, so nothing gets spoiled. Fantastic. Okay. So, Matt, tell everyone um, what we've got coming up. Okay, very different type of episode coming up. Later in this month is Mother's Day, so we thought, what can we possibly do? And (laughs) what better than letting our own mothers choose the films that we talk about? Which, um, I mean, I know what I'm going to be talking about. I don't know about you yet. I don't know if you know. I don't know what I'm going to be talking about um, yet. No. So it, it will definitely be interesting. And I hope it will be a very interesting range of films as well. I know my three are. Uh, there's also a film in there that I've never seen before. So there's an opportunity to to see something new as well as talk about things that we both like. So, yeah. I'm quite excited. I think that'll be uh, really interesting. So um, tell them where they can find us, Matt. You can now find us on the CineChat website. That's www.cinechat.co.uk forward slash podcast. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Spotify and iTunes. Just search CineChat Podcast, CineChat Pod or CineChat Official. You'll find us. And you can email us at podcast at sillychat.co.uk our brand new email address yes please make use of it yes we'd love to hear from you are you as much of a geek as we are Mm. about the sound of music if you've listened this far i imagine yes (laughs) (laughs) and on that note uh so long farewell alvina saying it's goodbye from me (laughs) and goodbye from me (laughs) do you like that one (laughs) really outdone myself uh... (laughs) that was a good (laughs) anyway